question. Everyone hear me okay too? Okay. And most of the time in these presentations, they don't want us to say trade names. There's a few places where I use trade names. If, if you're not um, getting the vaccine I'm referring to because I'm referring to it by its non-trade name, just ask. And I can say that. I just can't put it on the slides. So we're going to look at vaccine-preventable diseases with a focus on the adolescents, look at some of the current literature, and answer some of the questions from the literature. So we're going to start with HPV. So it's the most common sexually transmitted infection now in the United States. The current estimate is about 79 million people who are infected with 14 million new infections per year and 20 million are infected with genital HPV. And one half of that is in your adolescents and young adults, the 15 to 24 year olds. So 50% of people acquire HPV within five years of initiating sexual intercourse. And nearly everyone at some points in their life gets exposed to HPV. And for many, you acquire it and it resolves and you never really even knew you had it. So the biggest risk factor is sexual activity. And with that, there are more specific behavioral risk factors. So the earlier age they have their first intercourse, the number of lifetime partners, and also the partner's partners. So you have to start multiplying and factoring that in as well. And male partners that are older. Some biologic risk factors. Immunosuppression is a big one. You may not think of that as much, but your adolescents with Crohn's who are on the biologics, if they get HPV, they're going to have a much harder time clearing. It's going to persist, and so they're actually more at risk for cancer. Um, if there's any cervical ectopy, um, the anal transformation zone, so that's kind of where um, it's going from the epithelium more to the glandular cells. Um, those cells in that transformation zone are a little bit metaplastic sometimes anyway, so if they get infected, that's another place where the infection is more likely to persist. And then also um, being a male and uncircumcised. So you can acquire HPV actually two different ways. Um, what we often think of most is the sexual contact through sexual intercourse. <laughs> actually though, it, it doesn't have to be penetrative intercourse. There actually can be genital, genital, if it's on the hands, genital, just sort of that skin to skin contact, oral genital. Genital HPV infection in virgins is rare, but can result from non-penetrative sex sexual contact. Condom use reduces the risk, but it's not fully protective. Um, Non-sexual routes, um, if the mother actually has, for example, genital warts and the baby passes out and is born vaginally, some of those children do end up with laryngeal papillomatosis. It's vertical transmission, it's rare, but from following one of those children, there were a lot of procedures, a lot of scopes to try to get this disease under control. So it's a, a lot of morbidity for the child. And then fomites are hypothesized, but they're not well documented. So whether there actually is any transmission from things like undergarments, surgical gloves, biopsy forceps, it's kind of hypothesized, but not really documented. So HPV, there's 120 types. It is the established cause of cervical and other anogenital cancers, um, anal and penile cancers. According to the World Health Organization, in 2012, about 270,000 women died of cervical cancer. And as I mentioned earlier, it also causes genital warts. So you can kind of divide HPV into sort of the two different types. So the majority, or about 80 types, are the ones that infect the skin. And those are just common, kind of your common hand and foot warts. Then the other 40 types are the ones that infect the mucosa. And with those, um, the way to sort of remember this, the lower numbers are kind of the low risk. So 6 and 11 are kind of low risk or non-oncogenic types. So they cause the genital warts, laryngeal papillomas, and low-grade cervical disease. And then the higher numbered types, so 16, 18, and the numbers on higher up are the ones that cause the cervical cancers, anogenital cancers, and oral pharyngeal cancers. So this looks at what HPV type you find in invasive cervical cancer, and that big one in the red, let's see, is there a pointer somewhere or not? 
well, the red is 50% is the HPV 16, and then that um, green is the HPV 18, and then the yellow is 16 and 18 co-infection. So overall, about 70% of cervical cancers are caused by just two types, the 16 and the 18. This is one of the new studies about HPV just released earlier this year. So their estimate now is 45% of US men and women are infected with HPV. And a lot of our initial focus um, with the vaccines was the adolescent females and preventing cervical cancer. But what we're realizing is that men are actually more likely to stay infected throughout their lives. Over time, they probably have more partners. They have a higher number of partners, so they have more continued exposure to HPV. And they just don't seem to make as good of an immune response to it as far as women. So they're, they're more likely to have that persistent infection. So actually vaccinating the males may have an even greater impact on HPV transmission and cancer in men and women um, than previously estimated. This is just some of the um, earlier studies. This was published in 2016, um, sort of comparing <clears throat> the HPV prevalence in the nationally representative sample, which was the National Health and Nutrition Examination, or NHANES survey, um, before and after introduction. And this was the four-valent HPV vaccine. So even though we didn't have, we probably had less than 50% getting vaccinated, we did see the effect. So for HPV type 6, 11, 16, and 18, so those were the four vaccine types in girls ages 14 to 19 years. There was a 64% reduction in HPV prevalence. And then the uh, young adult women, the 20 to 24 year olds, there was, there was a 34% decrease. This is some um, data looking here at Indiana, so your state a little more specifically. This was a high school survey and asking students what percent had had their first sexual intercourse at less than 13 years of age. And the total was about 5.2%. It was a little higher for the boys than for the girls, 6.9 for the males, and 3.6 for the females. And then also higher there in um, the African American population. This is another um, survey, what percent of students had four or more lifetime sexual partners. And overall it was 16.8%, again slightly higher in the males than the females. And you see that number goes up as you go from 9th to 10th to 11th to 12th grade. And by the time you get to 12th grade it's up to about 30%. And again it's higher in the African American population. So some of the special situations then here. Um, so some people worry that once you're already infected, you can't get the vaccine, but that's really not true. You can still give the HPV vaccine if they have a history of genital warps, if they've had abnormal pap smears, especially if they're immunocompromised. And this is compared to the other viral vaccines is not live. So you can give it to pregnant women, you can give it to female patients who are breastfeeding. This looks a little at the safety, and we've um, gotten more data as we went along. So as of September 2015, there's 86 million doses given in the United States. They've done three large population-based safety studies with no real serious safety concerns. Sometimes there are these reports of syncope, but that's not really unique to the HPV vaccine. We see it in adolescents in general getting vaccines, just in adolescents for, for blood draws and some of a certain percent are going to faint. The most common side effects that we're seeing in clinical trials, uh, but here it was like one percent of the time and it was just higher than placebo, were common things you see with other vaccines. So fever, nausea, dizziness, injection site pain, swelling, erythema, bruising, so really not any different than other vaccines. This looks at HPV-associated cancers for the period 2004 to 2008. Do I have a pointer, do you know? Um, that shows? They can provide one, yeah. Okay, because the one on here doesn't show up on the screen for them. Okay. <laughs> okay, so to kind of walk you through this, um, the number one is cervical cancer, with the annual average number being about 11,900 or so. 
Number two is actually oral pharyngeal, and the rates there are vastly different if you compare males versus females. So males, it's about 9,000, females only about 2,000. So oral pharyngeal cancers in males are about four times higher than in females. And then the third most common cancer there is anal cancer in females with about 3,000. So yearly in the U.S., there's about 26,000 new cancers attributed to HPV, and 18,000 of those are in females. So what um, you may not realize is that what the um, CDC and various groups are predicting is that the annual incidence of HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancers, and those are going to be majority in males, is probably going to surpass the annual number of cervical cancers by 2020. So within the next three years, um, probably more oral pharyngeal cancers than cervical cancers. And that's despite the availability of this efficacious prophylactic vaccine against HPV. So this is kind of a, you know, when the parents are saying, I don't want to vaccinate my teenage son, you may have to really point this out about the, the risk for oral pharyngeal cancers in males. And oftentimes as they get to be adults, there's other carcinogenic factors like smoking, alcohol use. And so combined together, that really takes that risk up. This looks at the HPV-related cancers in Indiana compared to um, the United States. And you're pretty much um, close to the U.S. as far as cervical cancer. So it's about um, 7.3 for Indiana, 7.7 for the U.S., and that's per 100,000 population. Um, here's again, though, you can see this oral pharyngeal um, it's the Indiana males were 8.5, whereas the U.S. males were 6.2. Um, so again, that's a, a big, that's a really big group there that's going to soon surpass cervical cancer for having um, an HPV-related cancer. This looks at HPV and antigenital warts. Um, the peak prevalence is in women 20 to 24 years of age, 6.2 per thousand person years. In men 25 to 29 years of age, it's five per thousand person years. They're clinically apparent in about 1% of the sexually active U.S. adult population, and these are mostly caused by 6 and 11. So why do we vaccinate 11 to 12 year olds with HPV vaccine? So the vaccine's prophylactic, it's not therapeutic. So you wanna prevent the disease and you wanna prevent it before they're at risk for acquiring it. So um, uh, give the vaccine before they're likely to get HPV infection. Um, from those prior slides, about 6.2% of adolescents have had sexual intercourse before 13 years of age. And the other thing now we've learned is the immunogenicity of the vaccine, um, both for the two-valent and the four-valent, is higher in nine to 11-year-olds. So they'll get a better immune response if you vaccinate them at 11 years of age as opposed to waiting until they're older. I don't, sometimes it's just the younger you are with some of the things you make better immune responses. So that's what it probably is. Um, so again, you're gonna get the full benefit if the vaccine's given before their sexual debut. And even if they're infected already with you know one type, you're still probably gonna get some benefit. It doesn't have any effect on HPV infection that's already present at the time of immunization. But in the trials, um, these were women that enrollment had five or fewer lifetime sexual partners. 22% did have evidence of prior or current infection with one or more vaccine type, but less than 1% had been infected with all four types of um, the HPV and the vaccine. Um, this is just another way of looking at HPV prevalence among females 14 to 59 years of age. Again, this is that National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, so again, there you see that big group is the 20 to 24 year olds. Um, about 35% have the low risk types and then it's close to probably 45, almost 50% have high risk HPV types, which is a little, a little scary if that infection then persists. This is the risk of acquiring HPV. So this was looking at 18 to 22 year old university students. 
and they were enrolled if they have never been sexually active or were within three months of having their first male partner. So the one-year cumulative incidence of first HPV infection is about 28.5%, so almost a third within that first year of sexual activity acquire HPV. And that was higher if they had a male partner who'd had more um, partners as well. One of the big concerns um, that parents have voiced about the HPV vaccine is they often feel that their adolescent is too young. They don't want it to be viewed as something I've given you this vaccine that's against sexually transmitted diseases, so now you can go out and have sexual intercourse and be less cautious. So this was looking at a retrospective chart review of girls 11 to 12 years old from a large health maintenance organization basically divided into two groups, whether they've gotten HPV vaccine or not. And the outcomes they measured in relation to sexual activity were pregnancy, STI testing or diagnosis, and contraceptive counseling. They compared the incidence of those outcomes in the two groups. They received vaccine from July 2006 through December 2017, or 2007, and the outcome period was up to December 2010. So they enrolled 1,398 girls. Only 493 were on the HPV vaccine group. So again, what you might expect, less than 50% vaccinated. However, over 90% had received um, Tdap and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine. Only 35% had initiated the HPV vaccine. The group that was HPV vaccinated were more likely to be Caucasian, more likely to have other medical visits during the year. But there really wasn't any difference in socioeconomic status, the education level of the family, or the time in the health plan. So this is looking at the two groups. So the HPV vaccine exposed group, um, there were 493. And for the most part, they had gotten all three vaccines that they were looking at. They'd gotten HPV, Tdap, and MCV4, 474. And there, there are a few um, that had only got two of the vaccines and actually only one um, adolescent who'd gotten HPV without the other two vaccines. Then the HPV vaccine unexposed group was 905. 705 of those had got the other two vaccines, Tdap and, 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 and MCV4. And then there were a few that had gotten either Tdap or MCV, MCV4 alone. So what basically the outcome of the study was, the HPV vaccine was not associated with riskier sexual behavior. It didn't reduce any concern about um, the need for safer sexual behavior, and it wasn't associated with any of those markers of sexual behavior that they looked at. So it wasn't associated with pregnancy, counseling on contraceptives, or testing for or diagnosis of sexually transmitted infections. So I think you can point to the study and you know, say that to parents that it, it doesn't seem to increase their sexual activities. So a little bit about HPV vaccine itself. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really just composed of the protein of the virus. It's the L1 capsid protein. It has an aluminum adjuvant. There's no genetic material, so there, there's no um, of the RNA there, RNA there, DNA. And so that's why it's really not a, a live viral vaccine. And what they seem to be is over 98% efficacious against cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, types 2 and 3. So the prior vaccines, there was the two-valent vaccine, which it used much in the United States. Um, it was just against the two types, the um, 16 and 18. It was only ever licensed for the adolescent girls, so it never really was used much. And then, so what we were mostly using years ago in the U.S. was the four-valent vaccine, which was 6, 11, 16, and 18. But as of January 1st of this year, um, we only have the nine-valent vaccine available in the U.S. So this is known as Gardasil or Gardasil 9. It's made by Merck. It's got the 6, 11, 16, and 18, and then they've added those five additional types, which are all behind numbers, so they're the other types that also have a higher cancer potential. It's aluminum adjuvant, and it's licensed for females 9 to 26 years, 
and males 9 to 15 years, although with certain males you can also go higher as well. So if they started the series with the 4-valent or the 2-valent, you complete with the 9-valent. They didn't make any recommendation for giving the 9-valent vaccine if they've already completed a series with either the 2-valent or 4-valent. I think they figured it was hard enough to get the, even the 2 or 3 doses in and to try to say come back and get a whole another 2 or 3 dose series was going to be really hard. If someone comes in and, and wants the 9-valent and has already received all their doses of the 4-valent, it's okay, it's safe to go ahead and give it to them. So ideally, you vaccinate before they're exposed to HPV, but remember, even if they've already been infected, they probably haven't now been infected with all nine types, so they're probably still going to get protection. So recommended routine vaccination per the CDC schedule is 11 or 12 years. You can start as early as nine years of age. Um, females 13 through 26 years and males 13 through 21 years if they've not adequately been vaccinated previously. And that vaccination through 26 years is especially for those higher risk groups. So men who have sex with men, transgender people, and your immunocompromised people, including those with HIV, if they've not been previously vaccinated. The new thing here is there's the, the different dose recommendations. So if you're nine through 14 years of age, you only need a two dose series. So this is another reason to get the vaccine started early. You give the first dose at time zero and then six months later. If you don't start the vaccination series until you're 15 years and older, you have to get three doses. And the schedule is zero and then one to two months and then six months later. The second dose has to be one to two months after the first dose with a minimum of four weeks between. And probably what's gonna happen more often is there's gonna be longer time intervals, but you just keep going. You don't have to restart ser the series if there's longer times between the doses. Yes. That as long as you start, and that's what this slide's about. So if they're under 15 years of age at the time of that first dose, then they only have to have the two doses. So that's kind of it probably, you know, if you're talking to parents that come, or adolescents, they probably, the fewer shots, the better. So if you can get it in before they turn 15, they only have to have the two doses. And then versus if you're 15 years and you're getting that first dose, then you gotta have the three doses. So that this is an, another sort of reason why to, to vaccinate earlier. Okay, so these, then we got some questions. And I'll probably read them then. And if you want to answer them in or try to answer them. So we're, this is question 16. The percent of cervical cancers due to HPV type 16 and 18. Yeah, you need the, you need the, she needs the sheet. Okay. Anyone want to take a guess? C. C, correct. 70%. This is question 16. Everybody got, okay. So about how many new cases of cancer each year in the U.S. are attributable to HPV? So 26,000, 35,000, 1,000, 100,000. Okay, so it's 20, 26,000 is what the estimate is, and about 18,000 of those are in females. Question 18 is the second most common type of cancer associated with HPV. Let's see, right, so it's oral pharyngeal, although we think it probably in the next few years will actually over, overcome cervical, which is now number one. What's the rate of oral pharyngeal cancer in men as compared to women? So twice as high, four times as high, the same, or we don't know. Right, it's four times higher. Okay. And 
why do both the AAP and ACIP recommend that you can give HPV vaccine as early as nine years of age? So it can't be administered with other vaccines. It's prophylactic, so you administer before exposure. Young children don't complain as much about vaccines, or the vaccine's only effective when administered before puberty. B, right, so it's prophylactic. You wanna vaccinate them before they get exposed. And U.S. prevalence of adolescent genital HPV infection among girls 14 to 19 years of age. So 10%, 75%, 33%, or 5%. See, it's 35%. 30, or 33%. One of the common concerns about immunizing adolescents against HPV. So immunity is going to wane, a better vaccine is coming along, it's not effective, or being immunized results in increased promiscuity. D. And this refers to that study that we um, looked at, the outcome measures did they use to try to measure sexual activity. So they look at the frequency of testing for diagnosis of chlamydia or pregnancy. They use parental histories, adolescent self-report, or incidents of genital warts in the clinic population. A, right, they looked at testing for other STIs and also pregnancy as markers for sexual activity. And was there an increased rate of sexual activity related outcomes for girls who received HPV vaccine over those who did not receive HPV vaccine. So it's basically yes or no, or we didn't know the answer. B, there was really no difference in the two groups. Okay, everybody got the questions then? So next then is how to improve HPV vaccine rates. So this looks at HPV um, vaccination estimates um, and also some of the other vaccines, whether the child or the adolescent is at or below the um, poverty level. And actually, um, Poverty doesn't seem to be such a big factor here because many of those below poverty just have just as good vaccination rates of, of those that are at or above poverty. Here they you've got the, the HPV with the girls and the boys. So for the girls, as far as getting all three doses of HPV, it's probably only about 30%. And then boys, it's really low down there. It's only about 10 or 15 percent. So though I know you come out as 51st, but it's probably um, decimal point sort of differences because if you start thinking all states are about 20 to 30 percent, you may be, you know, like 29.5 and somebody else may be 29.6 in these surveys because we got all concerned a few years ago when Ohio was um, 48th overall for all vaccines, but then the next year it changed. So so overall, nobody is really in the whole United States doing very well for vaccinating boys. And even with the three doses for girls, I think everybody pretty much still is below 50%. Um, so this is another way of doing it. This is the 2015 National Immunization Survey of the Teens. So this is, they just pick though a certain percentage of random number of phone calls to call and ask if your adolescent has been vaccinated been vaccinated. Um, can they see that? Is that in focus well back there or not? Uh, so the first is Tdap, and so the Healthy People 2020 goal is about 80%, and we, and we meet that. And then the, the second group is the meningococcal. Again, the goal is 80%, and we pretty much meet that for United States overall as the orange and Indiana is the gray. So you do good with those two vaccines. And then for HPV females getting all three doses, Indiana is about 30%, so you're below the national average. And then um, you're not that much lower really though with boys. The boys are about maybe 27, 28% then. So um, again, um, no one in the United States does very well with that. We're below 30% everywhere really for the boys. 
So some different ways to try to do this. So the, the most effective method that they have is what they call reminder recall. And there's various different sort of ways at, at doing this. And this is sort of um, trying to increase attendance at clinics and also improving vaccination rates. So a reminder just basically is some sort of notification that a vaccine is going to be due soon. And recall is you, you're late for a vaccine, um, you've missed this vaccine, how do we get you back in to get it? So there's various different sort of ways um, you can do this. Um, often many practices with like HPV where there's three vaccines in a series, once we, they get that first dose, actually at that visit, they'll go ahead and set up the appointment for the second dose. Um, and then there may actually, while they're there at that clinic visit, have them fill out a postcard with their address so you can mail that postcard like a week before that upcoming immunization appointment. You could also do that by some sort of letter or telephone call. Um, there's various computer generated calls and letters. Um, you could use a card fall box with weekly dividers. Um, one of the things we did in Ohio, we have a magnet about HPV vaccine that they can put on like the refrigerator and it's got when they got the first dose and then when the second and third doses are due. So that's something they can put and hopefully every time they're opening that refrigerator, that's sort of a reminder of when they need to come back. Um, there's various computer generated lists. Um, it really sort of depends upon how your electronic record system is sort of set up. Some of them can actually be sort of programmed in to actually send through like a patient portal. Um, sometimes it's a simple thing in like a stamp or a clip that someone, the nurse or the medical assistant has already reviewed the chart and then they're sort of putting it on there and saying that this um, child needs an, an immunization at that visit, sort of reminding them the nurse and the physician. So a new sort of way to try to do this is with text message reminders. And there are some issues related with HIPAA with this. So you have to sort of, I think, discuss it ahead of time at the visit. But you can actually do this with adolescents. So this study, about 37% of adolescents had started the HPV series, but only 18% had completed it. So this was a study looking at ways to increase adherence by using texting. So it was an office-based study, about 15,000 patients. They did have vaccine-only visits, so basically visits where the adolescent could just sort of come in, get a vaccine, not have to, to see a, a nurse or not have to see a physician. Before the study, there wasn't any reminder recall in place. They used a commercial system called Call em All. So the subjects had to kind of opt in or agree to, to do this. So they basically had two groups, that group that agreed to the texting and sort of the standard care group. They got up to three texts. So the first one was sent seven days before the vaccine was due, then the day the vaccine was due, and then seven days after the dose was due. So this, and it may be a little complicated to see from the back and everything, but what it actually, if you looked at the text message group versus the standard care group, so the standard care group, only about 27% got that second HPV vaccine, where it is it increased to 73% if they, if they did the text message, and that was actually a significant difference. And it also improved with getting the third dose as well. So the study concluded that text messages could be an effective way to improve vaccination rates. Most of the parents said they actually preferred a text message over an email or a phone call, and adolescents said that they preferred text and that they frequently checked their smartphones. So this for them was actually um, probably a better way to reach them than the typical you know, phone calls, letters. Um, the other thing is this idea of missed opportunities for adolescent vaccines. So this was a retrospective chart review of adolescents, 11 to 18 years old, receiving care at a university medical center. So a missed vaccine opportunity, basically the child's in for some sort of visit, and it may be something that you don't even typically sort of think of as like a preventative care well child visit. It could be that they're in for their sprained ankle. But that's still an opportunity to vaccinate them. So the missed opportunity is they were behind on vaccine, they were there for a visit that didn't involve a high fever or serious illness, and therefore they were eligible to, vac to be vaccinated, but then they left the office without no one really bringing up that, um, hey, you're behind, you need this vaccine. 
So they had in their population 1,638 adolescents, which included 9,180 visits. 40% of these subjects had private insurance, and they found that those non-preventative care visits were the ones that were associated with more of this vaccine opportunities. So these were kind of the, the ill visits, but again, not really sick enough that they couldn't be vaccinated. So maybe the upper respiratory infection, um, the ankle sprain, um, and so the missed opportunities for vaccines, and it wasn't just HPV here, it was actually 85% um, was Tdap, that they oh, needed a Tdap and they, they walked out without getting their Tdap, and then it was about 82% for meningococcal and 82% for the first dose of HPV. So it's not just HPV, there's a lot of vaccines that um, they're missing. Probably a lot of adolescents, once they get to be that age, are not necessarily coming for, we try to say come every year for your well-child visits, but a lot of them don't come. And so when we're seeing them as more of the acute visits, and so we really have to sort of get them while they're there for that acute visit and get them um, caught up. So um, here, administering all needed vaccines. I know a lot of adolescents sort of look at you and say, well, I need three vaccines this visit. That's three shots. But it's probably easier to just go ahead and, and get it done. There's really no maximum number. They can get three shots at one visit. Um, trying to vaccinate at all visits. Um, look at, have somebody look at that immunization records at all the visits. Um, many offices use standing orders that once you know that they need that HPV vaccine, that order is already in that system. Um, it just then has to be signed off by a nurse practitioner or a physician when they were actually coming in for the visit, but then the nurse can actually give the vaccine. It could be an after-school clinic or something, uh, extended hours, and, and so that gives them a lot more access. The other thing we've learned about HPV vaccine is kind of how physicians and nurse practitioners present it, and sometimes we present it as a little bit more as optional, whereas we other vaccines we recommend much more strongly. Um, it's sort of the new vaccine, but it's been out there about 10 years or so now, so it's, it's not so much new anymore. Um, parents express the concerns over safety of efficacy. A lot are concerned that the adolescent's too young, they're not sexually active yet, let's wait until they're older. Um, and a lot of times when parents kind of come out with that, and a lot may depend upon how many things you have to do at, at that visit, how long it's going to take to do that conversation with the parent and try to convince them. Um, and then some providers actually do share the parent's view. The teen wasn't at risk for HPV right now, and we could delay vaccination until they're older. So this is like um, sort of, and this was from a study, what your actual versus achievable HPV vaccine co coverage could be if the missed opportunities were eliminated. So this is just getting the first dose in girls. So 54% were vaccinated, but you could increase that up to 93% um, if you use these other opportunities like the ankle sprain visits and things to get their vaccines in because 84% of them had some sort of missed opportunity visit. Um, are they going to get a copy of all these slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the electronic copy right now. Okay. So these are, you know, these are more if, if you have parents that really need the numbers on this cancer prevention. So, um, so currently there's 26 million girls under 13 years of age in the U.S. And if nobody gets the vaccine, then 168,400 develop cervical cancer and 54,000 will die. If we keep going about this 30%, um, we'll at least prevent 45,000 of those cases and 14,600 deaths. But if you can get that vaccination rate up to 80%, you'll prevent almost 100,000 cases and about 31,700 deaths. And so for each year, we kind of stay at 30%. Instead of achieving 80%, we're going to have about another 4,000 future cervical cancer cases and 1,400 cervical cancer deaths. I haven't seen that this phrase this way yet for the oral pharyngeal. I think that'll be interesting when we can get it phrased that way for them and also have something more for the parents of the adolescent males. So for a lot of parental concerns, some of them, like you said, they don't view it as it's not a required vaccine, so therefore it must not be as important if the school doesn't require it. Um, 
needing more information, they're concerned about an initiation or an increase in sexual activity, they think their child or adolescent has a low risk of HPV infection, they don't think the vaccine is safe, they don't think it's going to be a direct benefit for the son. So I think the things to sort of help them realize is it does prevent cancer. It's best to give it at 11 to 12 years of age. If you start it early, you only have to have the two doses as opposed to three. But it does it is important to get all the series, complete the whole series. Um, providers just being familiar with HPV epidemiology, outcome for infection, and making a strong recommendation for the vaccine. So what one of the practices in Columbus um, said they did was they actually did sort of this approach. They just come out and said, your child needs three shots today and put it all together. They would say HPV, meningococcal, and the Tdap. So they kind of presented, you're here, you're going to get all three of these today. And the reason why, we're going to prevent cancer, we're going to prevent tetanus, um, pertussis, whooping cough, and meningitis. So sort of presenting it all with the other adolescent vaccines, getting them all done at the same visit. Um, here's another example where you might want to uh, how to sort of address these concerns in about 45 seconds. So you're taking that approach. Um, it's Megan. She needs the three shots today. Mom says, well, why does she need HPV vaccine? She's only 11. And then you can tell her about protecting against cancer. Um, 33,000 people in the U.S. get cancer due to HPV every year. It's safe. We've now got over 100 million doses given, no really serious side effects. Mom's still coming out, though, that she's still very young. Um, and then I think here you can add in the part that we want to give it before um, exposure, before she initiates sexual activity. And the other thing is if you give it 11 years of age, um, you're getting a better immune response and you only have to get the two doses as opposed to the three doses. So these are just some questions on HPV vaccine. So this is question 25 on your sheet then. Um, the top reason for the parent not giving the child HPV vaccine then. Let's see, right, the pediatrician didn't really strongly recommend it. And, and like you said too, I think the fact that the schools, they just don't feel like it's a strongly recommended vaccine. Okay, strategy to be most effective in having parents get their child vaccinated against HPV. Okay, so I think that's the really CDC push now is to really bring it up as a cancer prevention vaccine. And what percent of cervical cancer can be prevented by the HPV vaccine? at least probably 70 percent um, because that's the 16 and 18. It, it may be a little higher. It's not 100 percent. It's probably not going to be 100 percent effective, but since they've added more time, it may actually be a little bit higher than 70 now, but it's at least probably 70 percent. So what percentage of adolescents in the intervention group? So this was the those adolescents that got the text messages. What percentage got their second dose of HPV vaccine? See, so that was the 73 percent. This kind of what method do they prefer as far as communication? Texting. And a missed vaccine opportunity? B. So they, they're coming for some other visit and then they're they need a vaccine but they leave without getting it. And what type of visits had the greatest likelihood for a missed vaccine opportunity? See the non-preventative care visits. And what group of patients were most likely to have had missed vaccine opportunities? Okay. So it really isn't, insurance status doesn't really affect it. And what vaccine was most likely to be associated with a missed vaccine opportunity, and that was in that study. A little bit of a trick with it, remember? Which one I said was higher than 
So now we're going to talk about vaccine See, hesitancy. So it was actually TDAP. Who, um, TDAP was they actually are, higher why they do it, HPV. and what we can do. So the vaccination actually comes from the Latin vaca for cow, and this was because of the first vaccine, which was Jenner's use of the cowpox vaccine against, to protect against smallpox. So the vaccination concept really started to control smallpox, which was a disease that was fatal in 30% of cases. And even today with the antivirals that we've developed, there really isn't a good one against smallpox. So it's really fortunate that we've been able to vaccinate. And smallpox is really the only infectious disease that we've been able to really completely eradicate with vaccination. Um, there's smallpox dating back all the way to the Egyptian mummies, and there were multiple large-scale outbreaks or epidemics of smallpox in many parts of the world. So that's kind of a, a difference to what we have nowadays because parents, um, we've been very successful with our vaccination program. So if you talk about diseases like measles and diphtheria and tetanus, these young parents really have no experience with those um, sort of diseases, which was very different, say, back in the 1950s, where parents really lined up to get their child vaccinated from polio because they really viewed that was a devastating disease, and if I have to stay in line an hour for get the polio vaccine, I'm going to do it. Um, so our vaccine has hesitant parents, the ones that don't immunize children, actually tend to be white, often um, have married parents with higher levels of education, a family income greater than $75,000 per year, and live in certain states that do allow philosophical exemptions. Um, one of our big um, sort of anti-vaccine groups in Ohio actually happens to be the chiropractor group. Often we get letters um, and the editor in the newspaper from them, and you think, well, they're healthcare professionals too, but they often are, are very strong anti-vaccine, we found. So probably this is something you're going to encounter in, in your practice. So when they survey pediatricians, 85% had parental refusal of some vaccines, and 54% had parents that re basically refused all vaccines. So about 28% or almost a third of parents have some significant immunization concerns. And how that breaks down, 9% kind of all will allow immunization. They're kind of doubtful, but it often comes up that you gotta have the vaccines for school, so go ahead and do it. That's kind of their reason. They're still not really trusting, but they go ahead and do it for that reason. There's about 13% that want to delay immunizations, put them off kind of as, as long as possible, and then 6% that absolutely refuse immunizations. So these are some of the reasons parents say that they're concerned. Um, there's this feeling now that vaccines aren't safe. The vaccine causes worse effects than the diseases they prevent, so they don't think you know measles and things like that are out there very much. Vaccines or the vaccine adjuvants, so this is the aluminum, um, the thimerosal, which is the mercury derivative, those have been blamed for causing autism. Um, giving all these vaccines at the same visit is going to overload the child's immune system, and these vaccine preventable diseases are gone, and they're not that bad sort of anyway. So as I mentioned earlier, um, most of these parents of young children have never seen these diseases. And so they only sort of see the risk rather than the benefit from the vaccine. Um, schools are a way to get at least those required vaccines into children. There's no law that children must be immunized, but for most states, if they're not immunized, they cannot attend public school. And so there's a strong incentive to get those what are the school required vaccines. And they vary state by state. And where I live is pretty close to Kentucky, and I can tell you Kentucky is actually more stringent with a lot of these requirements than Ohio, and so it varies sort of state by state. So um, some of the key facts on school vaccination, they're, they're state-based, so they're state-specific. These school vaccine laws have been upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. They all permit exemptions, um, and there's no requirement that states, though, do have to have exemptions. So, the exemption that all state has have is medical, and that, that's pretty standard. If the child's had a severe anaphylactic reaction to a prior dose of vaccine, you don't give that. And um, that's not really, that's a small group of children, that's not really a big sort of problem. 
48 states have religious exemptions, and um, that's sort of loosely defined state by state. So some recognized or established church or religious denomination that has some objection to a vaccination. So it doesn't have to be one of the major denominations. You can sort of start your own little church, and as long as you sort of call it a, a church, you can fit that one. And then Ohio is one of those 19 states that have what they call a philosophical exemption. And this is just basically, I just don't want my child vaccinated. Um, they don't really have to, in Ohio, state a reason why. They just mark it as philosophical exemption. I don't want my child vaccinated. That's it. Um, what they find, though, is the states that have those exemptions, especially that philosophical exemption, are the states that have more vaccine-preventable infections. Um, the states with the easier rules for exemption account for about 90% or more of cases of pertussis in the U.S. Among children 3 to 18 years old, they're about 25 times increased risk of measles, and if they're a little younger, 3 to 10 years old, there's a 60% increased risk of measles if you're in those states. The other thing is there's a lot of influences now on parents. I mean, they used to just sort of get vaccine information from really your healthcare providers, maybe um, other parents. Um, now that you can go to the media and the internet, and you have to sort of be careful when you type in immunizations and it gives you a bunch of websites because you can find yourself in something that's really um, projecting a very strong anti-vaccine um, message. And a lot of times, if you're just a lay person, it's really sort of hard to sort out, well, this site's very pro-vaccine, this site's very anti-vaccine, which one do I believe? Um, oftentimes, it's difficult to quickly communicate the truth behind the science. There's a lot of power of visual imagery. So up there, green are vaccines, so the idea that um, vaccines aren't safe, they have all these impurities in them, when really a lot of the things they promote, the sort of herbal and organic, really don't have the FDA sort of safety testing that vaccines have had. A lot of power of visual imagery, um, the one down there, the baby with all the um, immunization syringes in the background, the, the poison in the um, skull sort of thing. So a lot of exploiting parental fears. Which one did they give the <laughs> And they don't really, and that's just, you know, the, you're not going to give this, even to give all of them to do at the visit, the baby's not going to get this many vaccines at one visit, so they really exaggerated this. I mean, the most, maybe you may give two in each um, thigh or whatever, but the rotavirus is oral, so this little baby isn't going to get this many shots. So um, with addressing parental concerns, you really probably should start the dialogue early. And actually, they even recommend probably even at the OB at the prenatal visits because that first vaccine is going to be hepatitis B, and that's going to be given at the birth hospital. Try to listen to and understand their concerns. Um, think about what education is likely to be effective. I think you have to acknowledge that, yes, vaccines do have adverse events, but you have to sort of put things into perspective, that the risk of encephalopathy from natural measles is a thousand times higher than from the vaccine. This was a study that looked at what really convinces parents um, to have the child receive vaccines. And the biggest influence is really more information or assurance from the healthcare provider. So they still sort of come out and say that they trust really the healthcare provider more than anyone else. So I think if you can have everyone in your office sort of giving that same vaccine message, oftentimes I think it's just as simple as saying you vaccinated your own child or you recommend that vaccine, you want your adolescent granddaughter to get the HPV vaccine. I think that can be something that doesn't take a lot of time, but they realize that if you view it as safe and important enough and you're going to vaccinate your family members, then they should as well. Um, these are some of the things that they may bring up, um, but they've all been um, shown to be false. So the MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism. Thimerosals, the mercury derivative, that doesn't cause autism. Vaccines really don't overload the immune system, and vaccines don't really contain impurities. They're pretty um, scrutinized. If there's anything that we can get rid of or doesn't need to be in that vaccine, that's um, pretty well taken out already. So this is looking at children 
and how many vaccine antigens they were exposed to today as far as in the past. So some of these vaccines that we used in the past had a lot of proteins. So like smallpox had about 200 proteins. When we used the whole cell pertussis vaccine, it had 3,000 proteins. So if you're a child in the 1960s like me, you got from your vaccines about 3,200 antigens. As you can see, as we've gone over time, we've added more vaccines, but we've also switched from using the whole cell to the acellular pertussis. It's got fewer side effects and it's got fewer antigens. So even though they're getting a lot more vaccines, the amount of protein exposure is only about 125 or so. So I think you can point out that probably most people who got vaccinated back in the, the 1960s survived and did very well. We didn't really overload their immune system or cause them a lot of long-term problems. This is um, how much your um, immune system gets challenged every day. Just from even a viral upper respiratory tract infection exposes a child to about four to 10 antigens. Um, I didn't put it in here. There's a, a little slide, I think it may be on the Ohio AAP website about how many um, germs there are on a cell, a cell phone because people don't clean their cell phones and they're often in the office and they give the child a cell phone to play with. And I think it's like, you know, 20,000 or something per square inch or something of a cell phone. So that can be something that they have kind of common around and just how much even something simple like that exposes them to. And then this sort of addresses the mercury. This is Ari Brown. She's a pediatrician and author of some popular books for um, parents and children. So about the different types of mercury. So ethyl mercury and methyl mercury are actually very different. It makes that analogy between methyl alcohol and ethyl alcohol. So methyl alcohol is antifreeze. If you drink it, you're gonna end up in the ICU. Ethyl alcohol is a bud light, basically. So these are some questions on vaccine hesitancy. So this is with question 34. So what is not a vaccine exemption? Hey, poverty. And the initial laws to mandate vaccination um, were enacted to control which infection? The smallpox, because it was the one that was viewed as really a deadly infection. And outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases most commonly start among which of the following groups? So the people who refuse vaccines, because the medical exemptions are probably a small group. Even a lot of people on these delayed schedules do eventually get caught up for like school entry and um, children too young to be vaccinated. Is that's a pretty small group as well. Most common characteristic of parents with children who refuse vaccines. So right there, your your higher socioeconomic people who refuse vaccines, and the most important source of information about vaccines. Let's see, they really trust their healthcare provider. Okay, anything else on vaccine hesitancy? Okay, now we're going to go through some of the more specific um, vaccines and diseases. So we're going to start with pertussis or whooping cough. So the bacteria is Bordetella pertussis, spread by aerosolized droplets. Peaks occur all year, but it's usually kind of July through October is that peak of illness. It's very contagious. It's one of the vaccine preventable infections in the U.S. that we are seeing an increasing number of cases. And what we're realizing, especially with the acellular vaccine, is that immunity seems to wane probably about three to five years after vaccine. And there's also a waning of immunity after natural infection as well. So a lot of people think that because you've had pertussis or whooping cough, you don't need any more vaccines, but that's not the case. You still need to vaccinate. It's not lifelong immunity. So this is the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System. 
looking kind of over time. So there were, there were a lot of cases of pertussis. Then kind of in the mid-1940s or so was that first DTP, which was the whole cell pertussis, a really nice drop. And then it sort of um, stayed down. We switched in the 1990s to the ACE layer pertussis vaccine because it had more side effects. And then we started to see some increase there. And then in the mid 2000s was when we introduced that adolescent Tdap. And um, the next slide looks at where the pertussis cases occur. So the highest risk group is those under one year of age. And then the other peaks are next the seven to 10 year olds and then 11 to 19 year olds. So the estimated pertussis disease burden, the estimated cases in the U.S. is probably over a million. The problem with pertussis is it kind of starts out just like your common cold. And so a lot of pertussis probably goes undiagnosed. It may be an adult that smokes. It may just be sort of thought of as a smoker's cough. So what actually gets sort of reported, laboratory confirms, is probably only about 25,000 of those cases. And of that, about 9,000 or so, about 38% or so, is in adolescence. This is another way of looking at the reports of pertussis in the U.S., going from about 1990 to 2004. So what we're seeing in the orange there is those big increases in pertussis in the 10 to 19-year-olds and the 20-plus-year-olds. So about an 18 to 15-fold increase. And so that was the rationale for having the adolescent um, pertussis booster. So the reasons why pertussis is increased, the organism really hasn't underwent any major changes. There probably is more increased awareness and recognition, more testing for it. I think now when we see people that are kind of into that second or third week of cough, it at least comes to mind and we, we test pertussis. Obviously the problem with incomplete vaccination, but one of the big, um, probably the major factor there is that waning immunity in adults that um, even though we're giving this um, booster, and currently the recommendation is only for the one-time booster. So there's more clinical trials. It may actually get to the point we start recommending repeated um, pertussis boosters for adults. But again, it's going to be, it's not going to be a required vaccine, and getting these adults to come in and get it is going to be hard. Right. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but what you're really trying to do, pertussis could potentially be more severe if you get it while you're pregnant. So you, you as being a, a pregnant woman, you want to protect her from pertussis. And then also because those young infants, especially that first year of life, is going to be the highest risk for not only pertussis, but also more likely to be hospitalized is doing it sort of late pregnancy so that she passes the antibody to the baby and gives that baby that protection. So it's kind of not only protecting the mom, but also protecting the baby. And they realized if you get it like one pregnancy, often women space out babies by like two or three years, that immunity may have waned, that that next baby may not have it quite enough protection. And they realize now too that it's safe enough to give it at you know two year, three year intervals. So I think using the baby, they're sort of making more of a stronger pregnant women are in medical care, let's give it, let's protect the baby. But it, it could be really hard if we start saying, you know, like every adult should get a pertussis booster every five years or something. And that's probably what it would have to be. I don't know whether you, whether they would pick certain, you know, would you pick, you know, people who work with young infants, healthcare providers, but again, that's gonna be hard. But that may be what we sort of have to do. The other option is, what they're working on is to come up with maybe some sort of a compromise because we went to the whole cell, which had a really good immunity, but had a lot of side effects. The acellular, which has fewer side effects, but not as much immunity, do we really need to make a whole other pertussis vaccine that can kind of give longer lasting immunity? Um, so these are some of the estimates, but even natural infections probably only 15 years from some of those earlier studies. And the whole cell, 
Um, some of these are UK, Finland, Germany. Those were about six years or so. The early studies out of Italy and Germany were about six years for acellular, but it's probably not that quite that long because some of those may have actually gotten some whole cell vaccines along with, so it wasn't an all acellular pertussis vaccine schedule. So with adolescent and adult pertussis, it is pretty common for them to have symptomatic disease. 38% have a cough that lasts 15 weeks or more. 73% have the paroxysm, 69% have the whoop, and 65% have post-tested emesis. So 83% of teens miss school, 61% of adults miss work, and the average is 14 days of disrupted sleep. So the reason kind of how we talked about giving Tdap to adolescents is decreasing the disease in adolescents and adults, and then decreasing that transmission to young children. But what they project is you need at least 70% coverage in adolescents to achieve that goal of decreased transmission. So the ACIP recommendation is one dose of Tdap for adolescents 11 to 18 years of age. Preferred administration is 11 to, 15, 11 to 12 years of age. It can be administered regardless of the interval since their previous TD dose and you can give it with other vaccines at the same visit. So giving all three of those, the Tdap, the HPV, flu as well, meningococcal, that would actually be four vaccines at the same visit. Um, adults, if they're over 19 years of age, if they've never received Tdap, the current recommendation is at least they get one dose of Tdap. And then, um, then it goes back to the TD boosters. That may change. We're doing clinical trials, so it may actually be that kind of that TD sort of goes away and we just move to the boosters all being Tdap is probably what's going to happen. But then, again, 10 years is probably still too long. It's probably not going to last. Well, we have like people like my age who actually got the whole cell vaccine as children. We probably are, are a little better from having that immunity as a child from that one. So it may work okay, but the like the children of, who were born in the 90s who all their life have only gotten acellular, that's probably not going to work for them. So I think we'll have to, to figure out how to do that. And then like you, we talked about earlier, you get Tdap with each pregnancy, and they've sort of defined it now that you probably should really get it sort of that early third trimester, so like 27 weeks or so thinking then if, the, if you wait till like 36 and then the baby comes a little early, you've missed that opportunity. So I think they're moving more to like the 27 weeks or so to, to give it. Um, so we talked about already, pertussis is one of the diseases that's increasing. There's a lot in the zero to two year olds. Sometimes just having a, a case of pertussis to tell them about, we had um, one that actually died but was in the CICU, pulmonary hypertension. So I think sort of pointing that out to them, they don't, you know, they think pertussis is okay, the baby's coughing and not feeding very well, but actually no, your, your baby actually can end up in the CICU and actually die from this. Um, Canada was a little bit earlier, or a little bit later actually than us. They introduced um, DTAP in 1997, sort of the same reason we did, fewer side effects compared to the whole cell vaccine. Canada does sort of a similar schedule to we do it as we do, two, four, six, a little bit wider interval, 12 to 23 months, four to six years, a 14 to 16 year, and an adult. So this was a study out of Canada, which was to look at a better understanding of this waning immunity of pertussis and the impact on pertussis disease burden. So it was a meta-analysis, which is a statistical method for contrasting and combining results from previous studies in the hope of identifying patterns of having a higher statistical pattern power. So they set out, they looked at primary research articles that didn't include modeling studies that were going to assess long-term immunity, although long-term was really just 18 or more months of follow-up. The children received three to five doses of DTAP. They looked at 389 articles, but actually only ended up with 11 that they can use in the meta-analysis. So six that had data on three doses and five studies with data on five doses. 
The three-dose studies were all conducted between 2001 and 2006. The five-dose studies were conducted 2010 to 2013. They all measured the yearly incidence of pertussis. They used different diagnostic methods, so some used PCR, some used PCR culture, some used clinical symptomatology, and others used serology with the fourfold rise in antibodies to the pertussis toxin. So what they found was the risk of acquiring pertussis two to six years out from that last vaccine as compared to one year from the last pertussis vaccine. So as you go out, um, if you're only two to three years out, your odds ratio is about 1.42. As you get four to five years out, it's 2.81. And as you get six years out, it's about 5.14. So the, really that duration of immunity is probably only around four years or so. So if you think about what we do and what Canada, how they do it as well, if you get that dose when you're around four or five years with preschool, and we're not vaccinating till 11, there's probably some of those um, nine to 10 year olds now that don't have very good pertussis immunity. Um, and this was the estimated probability of vaccine failure based on different models of efficacy. So whether it's 80 or 85 or 90% efficacy, it doesn't really matter. When you get eight years out, there's about an 80% risk of vaccine failure. Um, and pertussis doesn't have, some of the other vaccines we use are more like 90, 95% or higher efficacy. Pertussis is only about, you know, 85% or so efficacy, so it's not as efficacious. Actually, HPV vaccine actually has a higher efficacy. It's about, you know, 97, 98%. So we really probably do need to work on a, a better pertussis vaccine. So the odds of pertussis increase by about 1.3 times for every additional year since your last dose of DTAP. The highest incidence of pertussis is the first year of life. The second highest incidence is those 10 to 14 year olds. And the average duration of protection after that fifth dose is probably only about four years or so. So the conclusion Canada made was that their booster dose at 14 to 16 years may be a little too late and we may need to really consider multiple doses in adulthood that may, you know, every 10 years, it might even have to be something more like every five years that has to be considered. So these are just some questions on pertussis. So this goes back to question one now, if you're filling out your form. The age group with the highest incidence of pertussis. So it's the young ones. And so, and at least in Cincinnati, I'd say probably most of the children who are under six months or so, probably we admit for pertussis, just to kind of watch and get a better sense of, at least for the short term. Definitely probably all under three months, but even under six months, I think. Most of the time we're a little cautious and go ahead and bring those babies in just because we've had some that have really had severe pertussis. Um, next is the main cause for why we're seeing more pertussis cases. So it's the waning immunity. And next is why we switched from the whole cell vaccine to the acellular pertussis vaccine. Let's see, the fewer side effects. So well, we went for safety, but what we lost in doing so was um, the immunogenicity. And at eight years after your last pertussis vaccine, how many are still going to have some immunity to pertussis? Let's see, only about 20%. And this was that Canada study, McGurr and Fishman, and what did they conclude? So it was all the immunity wanes over time. Probably in Canada, waiting to 14 to 16 years was too late, and the average duration of protection from the DTAP was only about three to five years. So next we're gonna go through pneumococcal, and you don't probably always think of this as being an adolescent vaccine, but it is important for certain adolescents, so that's why we included it here. So 
So if you look at the WHO estimate for vaccine preventable deaths in 2002, the one that really ranks the highest worldwide is pneumococcal disease, and that's especially in children under five years of age. So the first pneumococcal vaccine that was um, licensed in the U.S. for children was the seven valent vaccine. And this looks at its effect on invasive pneumococcal disease among children less than five years of age. So it was introduced around 2000 and we saw was a nice decline in overall pneumococcal disease. And the blue is those types that were in the vaccine and that virtually went to zero. These are just different studies kind of worldwide and what the efficacy was. Um, these are more from the clinical trials, but actually pretty highly efficacious, 94%, um, 83%, even in the Gambia, about 71%, so pretty effective vaccine. What happened, though, is this idea of serotype replacement. So our invasive pneumococcal disease was no longer being caused by those types in the seven-valent vaccine, but there were other non-vaccine serotypes often antibiotic or penicillin resistant. And the one that really emerged was serotype 19A. So that had the greatest increase in incidence in the United States. And so that's what led to the 13 valent vaccine, which got introduced in about 2010. And again, what we've seen, and this is a, a different y-axis, so it doesn't go as high, but again, we're seeing this nice decrease in overall pneumococcal invasive disease and also in those types caused by um, the types in the 13 valent vaccine. The question that's kind of gonna come up is, are we gonna get into serotype replacement again? And it's probably a little too early to say that yet, um, but it is sort of a concern. And then there's gonna be the, how many more serotypes can we put into this vaccine? Because we've got 13 in and we've got the protein. So I think that's gonna be something we'll have to watch over the next few years. The other vaccine that's out there is the polysaturide vaccine. So that's the 23 serotypes. It's the one um, for the elderly that we've used for many years. The problem is because it doesn't have protein, it doesn't give a really good memory response. So you get a little boost, but it's not really a high boost. And if you give this vaccine sort of repeatedly, it seems like the more you give it, the sort of less of an immune response with each subsequent administration. So there's the conjugate vaccine, which only has 13 serotypes, that gives you better memory and also gives the better boosting. So the current one for children is the 13 valent one. It's for all children 2 to 59 months of age, and then for children 60 through 71 months of age with chronic medical conditions. These high-risk children, though, and what we're, these are actually immunocompromised children are actually sort of getting to be a bigger group. So um, this was looking between 2007, 2009 among immunocompromised children, six to 18 years of age. 49% of invasive pneumococcal disease was caused by the serotypes in the PCV13, and an additional 23% was caused by serotypes included in the 23-valent vaccine. Looking a little bit about invasive pneumococcal disease, so in children with hematologic malignancies, they're 822 times higher compared to age-matched children without an underlying condition. So this is thinking about pneumococcal vaccines then for your adolescents' older children. And this has been one of our sort of um, areas where we've had a lot of um, success with a lot of quality improvement work recently at Cincinnati Children's. Um, actually, at Rheumatology Clinic, at GI Clinic, they are actually giving them their 13-valent pneumococcal vaccines. This was actually one that was actually probably an easier sell than HPV. Um, that talking about pneumonia, talking about meningitis, your child's immunocompromised, get this vaccine. It's routinely given to all babies. Um, this was actually one that had a lot of success. So for your older children with chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, cochlear implants, CSF leaks, functional or anatomic asplenia, and probably our biggest group is those that are on immunosuppressive medications. So all the like Crohn's patients, JIA, lupus, um, 
a big push. Our endocrinology clinic is now starting to introduce that as, as well for the older children. So here, if they haven't got the 13 valent already, it's recommended that they get first the 13 valent, and that's regardless of their past receipt of the 7 valent or the 23 valent. And then we're also, for that added protection, giving them the 23 valent polysaturide vaccine um, eight weeks or more later. So kind of giving them the, the 13 valent gives them that ability to sort of boost and have good memory and then the 23 is giving them protection against more serotypes. And then those um, that are really the most immunocompromised um, with anatomic or functional asplenia or HIV should get that second 23 valent. And that may be a little hard to kind of remember. We've had pretty good success with getting the 13 and the 23 because those are kind of in close proximity, but then how to sort of um, mark these children to sort of say in five years because a lot of them are going to be then with adult care providers to give them that um, second dose. Some of them it may be a little easier like the sickle cell patients who are still sort of followed in a sickle cell clinic to do that. Um, but sort of I think remembering pneumococcal vaccine for some of these older children that it's not just the infant vaccine. Okay. So what age do you give the 13 valent vaccine for all children then? Right, it's two months to 59 years of age. And you're getting to the point now, since it came out in 2010, most of them um, will have now, like if they're seven years or age or so in that age group, will have gotten the 13 valent all along. It's more those that are that are older, like your seven to teens, that you have to sort of think that they've probably got a seven valent, or if they're really old, they may not have ever had any pneumococcal vaccine in their life. Some of the high risk conditions. D. So that's all of those. And what's the recommendation then if they're six years to eighteen years and have a high risk condition? So if they haven't received the 13 valent previously, you give them the 13 valent. So they just have to have the one dose of the 13 valent. They don't need the three doses. You start with the 13 valent always first before you give the 23 valent, and you don't have to do it to every child in that age group. And compared to the general population for these children with a hematologic malignancy, what's their increase for invasive pneumococcal disease? So 800 times higher. Next, anything with pneumo Anything else with pneumococcal? So next is measles, and again, you may not think of it as an adolescent vaccine, but if they haven't had their two doses, you do need to remember to um, catch them up. So measles is an RNA virus, paramyxovirus. Humans are the only natural host, spread mainly by droplets, and pretty successful immunization program. They've decreased measles in the U.S. by over 99%. In 2014, the 506 cases that originated in the U.S., 81% were in unvaccinated and 13% of uncertain vaccine status. And 87% of those who didn't get vaccinated use, it, use that sort of personal belief exemption. So this looks at measles cases in the U.S. by year, and the big peak year was 2014, with over 600 cases that year. And the reason for that is several sort of large outbreaks, and one of those was in Ohio, where we had 383 cases. This started in an unvaccinated Amish community in Ohio. They had went as medical missionaries to an area of the Philippines that had a measles outbreak and then basically brought measles back. Um, they are a population that in many ways doesn't seek a lot of health care, a lot of vaccines for their children, and so they were under-vaccinated. Um, they actually they were very accepting of, of, vac of measles vaccine. It, it didn't take a lot to con convince them because they'd had... Um, 
this severe outbreak. The other thing, the only time I've seen tetanus is we had a little Amish boy um, last year who just very innocently scraped his knee on something out in the yard, no prior tetanus vaccines and had tetanus. And again, I think sort of using it as, using those as examples, they all sort of went out and got their child vaccinated against tetanus. So, and in that case, it's, I think really just giving them those examples and their own population um, this is something you can do to prevent this was really sort of successful. But it was really sad that to, to think that we have children who are at risk for tetanus. Mm -hmm. I think some of them did have to be in the hospital. So it's a lot. And that's your other thing. If you get measles when you're older, like adults, adolescents, you're more at risk for like the, the CNS side effects, the pneumonia, that sort of thing. So. Um, the other measles outbreak that you probably heard about, which was sort of in 2015, was California Disneyland, 200 people infected. There, even in children, about 20% of the children were hospitalized. Um, probably a traveler infected or overseas who then visited Disneyland. I don't think they ever exactly figured out the index case, but again, it was the same measles virus as to that outbreak in the Philippines. Um, this looks at measles. So there is some measles in children who are vaccinated with two doses of the MMR vaccine. So it's not 100%. Um, in the U.S., we give the vaccine at 12 to 15 months. Measles uh, vaccine is given in Canada as 12 months. And you might think, why don't we vaccinate children earlier in life for measles? And it's because most um, mothers have had either natural measles or measles vaccine. The antibody persists um, for a while and is passed to the baby. So like at six months, the baby may have residual maternal antibody that will actually interfere with the vaccine. And that's why you really have to wait and give measles vaccine at, at 12 months of age. Measles vaccine failures, there are some primary failures. Um, there's probably about four or 5% of people, if you give them one dose, they aren't gonna make an immune response. And that's really, in this case, the rationale for giving that second dose, that you're picking up that four or five um, that have had that primary vaccine failure. So measles isn't really so much a waning of immunity. And so that's what really led to that recommendation for the second dose of measles vaccine. So this was another Canada study. They had an outbreak. They looked at this outbreak of measles among adolescents who received the two vaccine doses. And they found that the age that they received their first dose was associated with a greater risk of getting measles. So it was about two to four times higher in children who were first vaccinated between 12 and 14 months versus if they got the vaccine after 15 months of age. Um, they did sort of get a con case control study to look at this a little bit more. Um, when they got their first and second dose, they adjusted some from maternal status of measles, whether natural infection versus immunization. So it was a match case control study. Adolescents who'd gotten two doses of measles containing vaccine. First dose administered at over 12 months of age. The second dose administered between five and 17 years of age. Cases were confirmed measles. They had five randomly selected controls for every case. There were 725 patients with confirmed measles. 507 were five to 17 years of age. 102 received the two doses at over 12 months of age. There were 19 only received one dose. 337 were unvaccinated and 49 had unknown vaccination status. So the majority here were unvaccinated um, children. Of those 102 who had gotten two doses, um, 82 were epi confirmed, only 20 were laboratory confirmed. The cases and controls attended 17 schools. The schools um, ranged anywhere from one to 41 cases. Two thirds of the cases in, were boys and adolescents contributed disproportionately to the cases. So they found in Canada, if you got it more at that 12 month side versus if you got it more toward the 15 month side, your risk was higher. Um, that age effect was not confounded though by gender, age at second dose, interval between doses, or the maternal year of birth. So these are on um, measles vaccine. So what factor had the highest risk? 
for acquiring measles among children who um, had received the two doses of measles vaccine. So this is that Canada study. See that they got it more at the 12 year, 12 months of age sort of mark. And why do we give measles vaccine basically at 12 months instead of at an earlier age like nine months? B, so the residual maternal antibody may interfere with inducing immune responses. If you do have a child, since people often take their children to other foreign countries and they're going to a country where there's a measles activity, you can give measles vaccine as early as six months of age, but you can't really count that dose. So if they were going somewhere, you would give the seven month old a measles vaccine, but then not count it. They still have to get their 12 months and the um, four, to, four to six year booster. I think it sort of depends upon if there's actual measles activity, then I think they put that in place, but at other times there they don't have that sort of requirement. And the primary reason for continued transmission of measles for those that have been vaccinated. B. So it's, measles is more the primary failure. Measles isn't so much a waning immunity because if they just get that one dose, there's about 5% or so that don't get immunity from that one dose. And so that's why we give the two doses. And then what do we use if we actually are confirming a diagnosis of measles then? actually cannot cannot be used as the answer here. See, so measles, because of the whole um, public impact of measles, um, even one case, we really want to try to confirm that case and then look in, in schools or whatever. So you, you really have to try to make the, the virological side of diagnosis. And the difference in risk, and this was the Canada study, if they got the vaccine at more the 12 month side versus over 15 months. So it's an, an increase. And this was also the Canada study. So what did they sort of conclude then from there? Canada's kind of moved, I think, more to what we are giving it between 12 and 15 months. This next is flu. We doing okay for time? Yep. Okay. So flu, people getting their flu shots themselves, and vaccinating their patients, okay. So the most common flu types in the U.S. are H3N2, H1N1, and B. About 36,000 deaths per year, 225,000 hospitalizations. Flu rate in children for hospitalization for those under two is pretty similar to the rate in the elderly. Um, the other thing with young children with flu, they shed the virus about two days before to 10 days after the influenza begins. So if they're in daycare, there's about a 12 day period or so there where they're, they're shedding flu and spreading it to their um, classmates. So we used to think that flu disease was mostly caused by A, but what we're finding now is that there is a lot of um, B flu viruses. And in the 2010 to 11 season, about 38% of flu deaths in children were due to type B. The numbers from last year was 101 flu deaths for children, and I think this was the first time we got over 100. So. Um, Last year, I guess, although we didn't necessarily think of it, I don't think is a really bad flu year, it was high for um, children as far as deaths. 85% of those deaths, um, they had not received the, that season's flu vaccine. So if you want to prevent flu in your child, vaccinate them. Um, since 1978, we've had the the, the trivalent or they've got the new abbreviation it used to be TIV 
Now they're calling it IIV3 or inactivated flu vaccine 3, which had the two A's and the one B. We sort of have to change the components each year because flu viruses keep mutating. And so we try to predict ahead of time. Well, really, we sort of have to predict in like, um, you know, March or April to make the flu vaccine, to have it ready for, to administer in like September, October. So it's really looking at what's going on in the rest of the world and trying to predict what are those three or four flu viruses that are most likely to be circulating. And so now we've added that second B. So we've got the quadrivalent vaccine, IIV4 or QIV. So we basically the recommendation now is vaccinating all children six months through 18 years of age. Um, and for this year, um, actually it was the same for last year, you don't use the intranasal vaccine anymore. It doesn't seem to work. So it's all the it's really all now the injection in the arm. Um, really, they say everybody, if you have to sort of focus, it's the 6 through 59 month olds, and obviously those with have underlying conditions. You can use either, there's an IIV trivalent or an IIV quadrivalent for children. Um, the other thing that's come out this year, and it, it's raised sort of, um, questions in Ohio, and I don't know if you notice this, and this is going to be a case where I have to use the trade name of the vaccine. So the one you've probably always sort of had in the office is flu zone, and it's um, the quadrivalent flu zone, which for those young children, the six months to 35 months, it's the 0.25 mLs. The other vaccine that is new this year which was tested in that age of children is a also a quadrivalent IIV4, which is flu laval. Flu laval, the dose is 0.5 mLs for everybody. So you are giving um, really those young infants that double dose. And so from that clinical trial, they actually got at least as good or a better immune response. So I think you have to look what vaccine. I know some offices have said, well, we've got both in the office. We've got flu label and we've got flu zone. So you have to watch the dose because it's a different volume that you're giving to your young infants. So I don't know if that's how we sort of handled that at Cincinnati Children's is we just got flu label for everybody. So everybody gets a 0.5 ml dose. I know some offices may have ordered earlier, and so you may have two vaccines in your offices, and it really comes up with those young infants. Um, the CDC really didn't make a preference um, here with this. If they're under nine years of age and they've had less than two prior doses, they need two vaccine doses. Um, there are the antivirals, also Tamivir is the Tamiflu's, and Nimivir is inhaled. These, as far as we know, we think um, they're still going to be effective against the flu viruses that will be circulating. We, we may not know that for sure until we actually figure out and make sure there's not something different. But we do still think we have effective antivirals. But they get their most effectiveness, though, if you can get them started um, with an illness onset less than 36 hours. So this is about the quadrivalent, the IIV flu vaccine in children. This was the phase three trial. So the six to 35 months were open label, meaning they all got the IIV four. And then the three to seven year olds got randomized to either the trivalent or the quadrivalent. If they're over nine years of age or they'd had two previous flu vaccines that were considered prime. They drew blood on day zero, so before the vaccine, and then 28 days later, and they basically looked at antibody responses or geometric mean titers between the trivalent and the quadrivalent groups. So about 3,000 children enrolled and vaccinated. Most of them had blood draw, and 2,900 were followed for six months. So this, and you may not be able to see it from that far back, but this looks at basically immunogenicity, and it's looking at that A California 2009, so that was the pandemic strain. And what you can see there with, even with like the TIV or um, the, um, it's TIV, IIV4 or IIV3 basically, 
looking at the titer sort of pre and post, there is that increase in titer um, for all of these children. Um, and then if you look, the top is for all children, um, all the age groups, and then looking at the six to 35 months old. And if you look at that post titer, it's a little lower for the younger ones. And so that's sort of why we're still having to give those younger ones those two doses of vaccine um, rather than just the, the one dose. So basically geometric mean titers, and this is just showing for the one antigen, but for the other antigen, they're higher in the children three to 17 years of age as compared to the, the six to 35 month old children. And this is more just looking at immunogenicity and the sort of um, that QIV and TIV or the, whether you give quadrivalent or trivalent, it's, it's non-inferior. So that's why the CDC hasn't made any preference over the two. Um, this just looks at how we do with vaccinating um, children in some of the different years. And it was around 2004 when they, the ACIP started recommending flu vaccination of all children in that 6 to 23 months. And then as, as we go on out, um, still it's only about 35% or so that get one or more doses and you know, only about 20% or so that get all um, the doses. So flu vaccine is another one um, that um, we really need to work on improving our immunization rates. And then this just shows kind of the really the, the peak month for flu in most of the recent years has continued to be February. And then the other peaks are kind of January, March as well. So. So this was looking back in that study, 2010 to 2011, the percentage of flu deaths in children related to influenza B. B, so it's 38%. This is question 39 now that we're on. An open label study. Let's see, so this was when they um, did the study with the uh, all the young children got the quadrivalent activated flu vaccine. <clears throat> A difference in immune response to flu vaccine in the infants, the six to 35 months, as compared to three to 17 months. <clears throat> okay. And then so that's why you're giving these young children. Um, and even though it seems like now we went to this higher dose when we're still having to give the two doses, it just seems that they really do better with those two doses separated by that 21 day, 28 days. And I think this is the last one. We still okay with time? Uh, yeah. Okay. So meningococcal disease. So um, I guess this is sort of one where maybe a photo is, is worse were sort of a thousand words, so this is basically really severe um, meningococcemia, um, can result in meningitis, gangrene, loss of limbs. Um, for those of you who are familiar, Amy Purdy is one of the Paralympic um, snowboarders, and so she has sort of really gone out there. She has a, a website called Meet Meningitis, and so she was a healthy young adult, um, acquired meningococcemia, um, basically is a double amputee now, has a kidney transplant. And so if you, if parents want to know more about this, her website is Meat Meningitis and she basically sort of shares her story. To, it's a, a rare disease, but it's very significantly life-changing. So only about 2,000 to 3,000 cases per year in the U.S. Most common age groups are under one year of age and 16 to 21 year olds. Five major serotypes of meningococcus mortalities, um, 10 to 15 percent even with treatment. And then there's another 11 to 19 percent who lose arms or legs, um, maybe deaf, have seizures, have stroke, it can affect the kidneys, um, kidney failure, renal transplants. 
So this looks at meningococcal disease incidence. So that big group there is under one year of age. That's really the biggest group. And then the other peaks are kind of the 15 to 18 and the 19 to 22 years. And then our meningococcal vaccine, the one that's um, required for school entry, at least in Ohio, and I think many other states do it as well, is the ACWNY. So that's protecting against those four serotypes. What we'd have liked to have been able to do is to just put the B in the same vaccine, but the B antigen kind of looks like a self antigen and it doesn't really, when you try to put it in, you can't make a good immune response to B. So they had to sort of play around. And so we've ended up with the meningococcal B vaccine being its own separate vaccine. And then we really haven't studied it down and it's sort of gonna be sort of, I guess, a cost benefit thing. So they're, so the like under one year of age group is where there's a lot of incidents, but it's still only two cases per 100,000 population. So it may never come out that meningococcal vaccine is really gonna be cost effective to vaccinate all infants for it. And that's even starting to come up with meninge B vaccine in adolescents and how cost effective it really is to say it's a, a, a recommended vaccine. So there are groups that are higher incidence for Neisseria meningitis. So again, our immunodeficient patients, those that don't have a spleen, HIV infection, if you have a family member who's had meningococcemia, Smoking and even passive exposure to smoke probably increases your risk. Having a recent upper respiratory infection, crowded living conditions, and college students living in dormitories. So meningococcal vaccines, the, the first ones were polysaturides or unconjugated. We don't hardly use them anymore. This is T cell independent, so again, not very good memory. They don't work in children under two years of age. Pretty short-lived efficacy. So we move to these conjugate vaccines that are T-cell dependent, that give good memory, basically covalently linking the polysaturides to inactivated bacterial toxin products or toxoids. You can give them as young as two months of age. So for example, a child that was born without a spleen, you would start meningococcal vaccine at two months of age. And this is the preferred vaccine for people under 55 years of age. So the meningococcal ACWI or the quadrivalent vaccine for adolescents, the first dose is 11 to 12 years of age with the booster at 16 years of age. If you get the first dose at 13 to 15 years of age, then you still need to give the booster at 16 to 18 years. If the first dose is given after 16 years of age, then you only need the one, um, no booster. The problem is though, if you wait, um, your, there's those years where you don't have protection. Ohio has actually moved toward you have to have the first dose sort of for like that seventh to eighth grade entry and then the second dose for 12th grade entry. So in Ohio, this has become a, a required vaccine. And then children at high risk of meningococcal disease, it really depends upon what age you identify and start them. If you start them at two months of age, they need four doses. If after seven months, a, a two dose series, and then you booster them every five years. So the high risk conditions here are HIV, asplenia, and some of the complement component deficiencies. Meningococcal B, these are the new vaccines. There's two that have now been licensed. Um, first in October 2014, there's um, one called Trumemba, which is a three-dose series, although now you can actually, they're starting to look at just taking that down to a two-dose series as well. And then in January 2015, the second one, Vexera, come out, it's a two-dose series. These are approved 10 to 25 years of age. This is a little different with other adolescent vaccines, so the ACIP gave them this permissive or individual choice recommendation. So they didn't think it was cost effective to make it a re recommended vaccines for all adolescents. So they've sort of recommend, sort of left it up to really providers and adolescents and their parents. Um, you should use the same product for all doses. Um, Again, in Ohio, it kind of is how practices, I think, sort of sell, sell it. Um, the ACIP at, at least is saying you should discuss it with adolescents and their parents. At least tell them about its availability, ask them about it. 
Um, the Vaccines for Children program does cover it. A lot of the private insurances will cover it as well. So we're not finding costs to be so much of an issue. It's more the parents that only get whatever vaccines are required for school entry or parents that are, I'm only going to get a vaccine if it's, you know, absolutely recommended. And I don't know that it'll ever fall into that category because it, it's a rare disease. It's probably never going to be cost effective to say vaccinate everybody. So I think this is the last set of questions then. So the difference in immune response between conjugated and unconjugated. Conjugated vaccine, you put the protein with it, so you get the T-cell dependent immune response. Whereas unconjugated is T-cell independent. And so the young children, the children under two years of age can't make that um, T-cell independent immune response. So that's why like the 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine, you can't give it until they're 24 months of age. And the preferred age, the first dose of the meningococcal conjugate vaccine to healthy children. Let's see, so you're at about 11 to 12 years of age. And if they get their first dose at 13 to 15 years, what about a booster? B, so they still have to get the booster at 16 to 18 years. And if they get their first dose on or after the 16th birthday, D, so they don't get a booster.